Welcome to this ADB annual meeting event on evolving safeguard policies and enhanced implementation as a driver of sustainable development. My name is Warren Evans and I will be the moderator for this event. For those of you that don't know me, I'm from ADB and currently serve as a special senior advisor for climate change in the office of the president and as the ADB's climate envoy. I was recently appointed to this role after spending five years, the last five years, as ADB's special project facilitator, leading the problem-solving component of our ADB accountability mechanism. This is an independent dispute resolution function of supporting the needs of project-effective people for ADB finance projects. This session is about evolving environmental and social safeguard policies and standards and how we can make them more effective and implementable in the Asia Pacific region. The backdrop to this session, as many of you will know, is that ADB is in the process of updating its 2009 safeguard policy statement. ADB is working towards publishing a first draft by January 2023, and we are seeking views and recommendations on the directions that safeguards should evolve towards. This session forms part of our stakeholder engagement process. So we hope that you will be actively engaged. There are several key issues that we will consider today. What are some of the critical challenges that we are facing in the region that safeguards should address? What can we learn from past experiences, including good practices, as well as from where things have not worked out so well? What are the emerging issues that need to be included in the next generation of policies? For example, on strengthening social dimensions and on climate change? How can we enhance politician, such as through enhanced stakeholder engagement and with application in different country contexts and for different financing instruments? We will explore these points through a dialogue with a panel of five esteemed speakers from government, private sector, and civil society, each sharing their views on current issues, experience, and future needs. For the program, each panelist will have 45 minutes each to provide remarks on questions that I will share with them. This will then be followed by about 15 minutes for questions from the audience. After that, I will ask the panelists for final remarks and then I will wrap up. We'll use Pigeonhole Live for our Q&A session. Pigeonhole Live is a simple, interactive, mobile website where you can submit questions to this panel's speakers. You can also vote on any questions that interest you. If you are watching us live, all you need to do is click the Q&A icon on the right side of the page and it will direct you to the questions, to the session's Q&A. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, you may scan the QR codes you can see on the screen or just launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.com into the address bar. Next key in our event passcode, which is ADBMNL55, all caps. Once again, ADBMNL55. If you have any questions throughout the panel discussion, feel free to submit them through Pigeonhole. Questions with the highest number of votes will stand a better chance to be answered by the speakers. Let me now welcome and introduce our five panelists. Timothy Batan is Undersecretary for Planning and Project Development, Department of Transportation in the Philippines. Mr. Batan is an attorney and former practicing lawyer and is currently focused on modernizing transport infrastructure in the Philippines. Elena Berger is Executive Director at the Bank Information Center based in Washington, D.C. Ms. Berger is a human rights lawyer and has been with BIC for about 10 years, focusing on the policies and programs of multilateral development banks and with significant personal focus on child rights, social inclusion, and gender issues, among other issues. Joan Carling is the executive director for the Indigenous Peoples' Rights International. Ms. Carling is an indigenous person and activist from the Cordillera, in the Philippines with more than 20 years of working on indigenous issues from the grassroots to international levels, including as former general secretary of the Asia Indigenous People Pact. 
Case Srikant, chairman is chairman and managing director of Power Grid Corporation of India Limited. Srikant has been in his current role since 2019 after a career of more than 30 years in the power sector in India and with a background in decrees in commerce and finance. Finally, Gurchatan Sandhu is the director of programs at the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans, and Intersex Association, or ILGA, World. Gurchatan joined ILGA World 2021 after 17 years with the International Labor Organization, where he focused on non-discrimination issues. You can find further information in their bios through the event page of the ADB annual, wait, annual meeting website. Now let's get to the discussion. First is for Undersecretary Batan from Philippines. Undersecretary, I would like to ask you about the value of applying good practice safeguards. We know that the Department of Transport in the Philippines has been leading some major new infrastructure investments. What has been the value of applying ADB's current safeguard policy in addition to the country system? And what are some of the key lessons you've learned? Thank you. Thank you for that question, Warren. Uh, first of all, uh, the value that we have seen from uh, having conscious regard to social safeguards is that it aids in implementation. Implementation speed, implementation uh, success. There is a general misconception that uh, some of our, uh, some areas of government uh, would have that compliance with social safeguards is an additional burden to implementation, which makes a project either more expensive or takes more time to implement or both. In our experience, particularly with our uh, massive railways projects that our that Asian Development Bank and other development partners have been supporting, our experience has been to the contrary. Our experience is that by investing time and conscious effort in making sure that our projects are implemented in a manner that is uh, compliant with social and environmental safeguards, we achieve an implementation uh, scenario that has less hiccups, that has less problems, that has fewer roadblocks in the long term. So just to give you an example, in our uh, four years of implementing uh, the North-South Commuter Railway System, which is being partially funded by the Asian Development Bank, we have not had to resort to any forced demolition or forced eviction or forced displacement. All of our resettlement efforts of informal settlers have been voluntary to date. And we attribute that in large part to, again, very conscious regard to social safeguards from project preparation to project development to project implementation. Similarly, when it comes to the acquisition of uh, properties, our record has been to have more than 80% of the property owners voluntarily selling to the Department of Transportation without us having to resort to expropriation or eminent domain. So again, we attribute this to our engagement, to our early engagement with our stakeholders where we explain the fairness of the procedure that we are following and that we are required to observe based on our lender's requirements. Now, you mentioned about the value of uh, complying or observing these uh, safeguards over and above our domestic requirements. Um, part of the advocacies uh, or the policies of the department, uh, especially uh, from our rail projects, is to elevate to the national legislative agenda the adoption of the best practices that we have uh, been developing based on ADB social safeguards, for example, into our national legislation. 
because um, again, coming from experience, we can demonstrate that uh, the fairer you are, the better you invest, the better it is for the project overall. It's not just a box that we have to check in order to demonstrate or to show to our lenders that we are complying, but it is a necessity if we want to avoid any uh, project delaying uh, problems along the way. So, Warren, these are uh, some of the very positive experiences that we can share when it comes to our uh, implementation of our ADB supported projects and our compliance with ADB social safeguards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Undersecretary. I, I uh, recall when the, when the North-South Railway was being initially discussed, uh, having several sessions when I was the special project facilitator with your teams and the amount of work that went in to preparing for that massive uh, relocation uh, element of that project. And, and congratulations on uh, nobody complaining to, to me and my old role at ADB for, uh, for issues with regards to compliance. So uh, that's good news. It, it, and, and basically, uh, I understand from you, it's led to consistency, efficiency, and avoiding delays in addition to um, treating the, the project effective people fairly. Thank you so much. Um, next, uh, I'd like to uh, go to Elena. Uh, and um, and uh, the, the question for you is really, in your role in monitoring safeguards of MDBs for many years, uh, looking over the shoulders of, of the MDBs in a very constructive and active way, um, and, and being actively engaged in the consultations that we've had on, on the update for the safeguard policy here at ADB, what do you see some of the most critical issues that you feel the next generation of safeguard policies should uh, consider? And if you could highlight two or three of, of those key concerns, uh, it'd be appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. It's a great question. And I really appreciate the ADB, including us in this panel, and in particular, really um, allowing critical civil society to share their views on the safeguard. So thank you. Um, and I do have some probably strong views on the safeguards, because I think that safeguards need to be designed so as not just to prevent harm, but also to enable the ADB to amplify its development outcomes. So I want to highlight three specific areas where I think it's really important for the next generation of safeguards to take on. And the first of those is climate. Climate is the obvious one, right? Um, we are seeing that ADB uh, engaging in its safeguards review at a time when it has the opportunity to take on a real leadership role on climate. The World Bank has sort of stepped back from a leadership role, and I think there's the opportunity for the ADB to lead here. However, leading is not about the rhetoric. It is not about making lots of commitments at high levels on climate. It's really about thinking about how the projects impact the climate on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I think that what ADB needs to do with its safeguards is one, make sure that all projects are Paris aligned and to really grapple with what that means to be Paris aligned, to address the need for MDBs to invest in overcoming the inadequacy of aggregate national determined contributions. And we need um, the ADB to embrace double material materiality, sorry, the concept that climate mitigation and adaptation both need to be addressed in synergy. Second issue that I want to highlight here is stakeholder engagement. And the reason that's so important is it's really the entry point for addressing all the other types of issues that the ADB needs to address through safeguards. You can't understand the needs of the communities without talking to them. And if you don't understand the needs of the communities, then you can't design projects to meet those needs, and nor can you design mitigation measures to prevent harm to communities. And as you're designing projects, to, uh, as you're designing safeguards to address stakeholder engagement, two issues I want to highlight. First is the question of civic space and the risk of reprisals. No bank at this point does this well. 
if there is a fear of reprisals, even if there are no instances of reprisals, that really chills speech. And it means that communities may not raise issues that are of concern to them, and therefore the ADB can't address them. So I would love to see the ADB be sort of first in class at addressing this issue and really grapple with how to carry out consultations in countries with restricted civic space, especially when in most cases it's the borrower that carries out these consultations. How do you do this? Um, the second aspect of stakeholder engagement that I wanted to highlight was inclusion and making sure that marginalized groups are reached deliberately as part of stakeholder engagement. If you do not connect with these marginalized groups directly, you can't understand what barriers they may face to accessing project benefits or what particular project impacts may fall harder on these communities. And then the final safeguards issue that I wanted to raise here was around prevention of gender-based violence and sexual exploitation and abuse. This has long been a taboo issue. Um, we, BIC, found a lot of cases of sexual exploitation and abuse on World Bank funded projects. Um, when we first brought these to the World Bank about eight years ago, they had no mechanism for dealing with them and didn't really take them seriously. But once we had an inspection panel complaint at the World Bank, so the equivalent of, of the ADB's accountability mechanism, the bank started taking this seriously and we've really seen the ball start rolling at the various MDBs in addressing sexual exploitation and abuse. But yet again, the ATB has the opportunity here to go beyond what other banks are doing. It's not good enough to just say, hey, put together project documents that look at the risks of sexual exploitation and abuse. Because in many cases, these issues being so taboo, it's very unlikely that people report these to to grievance redress mechanisms. So mechanisms have to be designed sensitively, and the best way to do that is to work with NGOs that are already connected to the community, sorry, NGOs or CSOs, and in particular to connect with groups that have the trust of women, children, sexual minorities, marginalized groups who might not otherwise be able to report these, these cases. Because having those cases reported all the way up to the ADB is the first step in solving them. So I'll stop there um, and, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. The, um, all three of those climate stakeholder engagement and, and gender-based violence, uh, sexual exploitation are um, huge challenges. None of them are easy to tackle. We're, um, I, I should say that uh, our safeguards team is uh, watching this and uh, listening uh, very carefully, and, um, and uh, we recognize how difficult this is, but uh, we're committed to, to tackling them um, to doing a better job, and, and certainly, uh, you know, the, the the support from from you and others in these areas is going to be critical going forward. Not just in coming up with the new safeguard policy, but actually then rolling it out and making it making it work. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to move now to Joan Carling, uh, Executive Director of the Indigenous Peoples Rights International. Uh, Joan, as you know, the the review of ADB's current safeguards by the Independent Evaluation Department highlighted that ADB had missed opportunities to many, meaningfully engage and provide culturally appropriate benefits for indigenous people in some of our projects. Uh, as an indigenous person and as a longtime champion on IP rights, I would like to ask you for your views on the critical areas that need to be looked at for future safeguards. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Warren. Let me contextualize uh, our discussion today uh, just to mention that indigenous peoples in the Asia Pacific is around 350 million, which is 8%, 8% of the total population of the Asia Pacific region. And majority are poor and heavily marginalized, and majority also lives in remote areas and, and town centers. Now, of course, uh, it's clear that uh, indigenous peoples are 
the targets of ADB when it comes to development um, interventions. In relation to the safeguard policy uh, improvement and also in, uh, the implementation, I want to highlight three elements uh, in relation to the indigenous peoples policy. First, that, that needs is, is strengthening is the one on the free prior and informed consent, where consent as a broad community support should be made into consent based on the collective decision of the affected communities uh, undertaken through their own um, process, identified process, because there's a difference between broad community support, because who, who interprets broad community support when consent is clearly a decision and it should be based on a collective decision by the affected community. So it, it, it's categorical. It, it should not be based on any kind of interpretation. Uh, so that's one, so that it, it's clear if the project has the support uh, uh, of the community as, as their decision, okay? The second is on the indigenous people's plan. Um, this is uh, to ensure the, the plan is to ensure appropriate mitigation, but also benefits for communities. But, but often, the, the part on the, on the benefits for communities is not really elaborated. And the particular support for communities such as culturally appropriate livelihood, uh, uh, livelihood needs, uh, also in relation to basic social services, are not provided with budgets. These are sidelined normally. So it becomes in many cases just a, a pro forma. There's no real implementation. And often they say there, there's no budget allocation uh, for, for, for this because this is one of the critical areas of meaningful participation of indigenous peoples. The third is the establishment of an effective and appropriate uh, culturally sensitive grievance mechanism at the project level. Because if there's no, the grievance mechanism uh, that cannot even, I mean, the, 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 the ones assigned there cannot even understand the language of, of, of indigenous communities, then how can they address or how can people uh, go to these grievance mechanisms? Uh, it does not, it's, it, it's not uh, uh, culturally appropriate. So that's the, the third point. Now, in relation to the needs and opportunities, uh, I, 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 I certainly agree with uh, our, our earlier speaker that the, the approach should not be to do no harm, but also to do good. And in relation to the current, and I do agree that climate change and sustainable development are not separate now. And from the context of indigenous peoples, what we need now as, as, as in response to need and opportunity is a partnership. This is an opportunity for indigenous peoples to have partnership with ADB and, and governments to advance the SDGs and combat climate change. Our lands and resources are our assets that can be used for sustainable development and climate change uh, action. But we need to learn from the past, particularly on the issue of just transition. We've seen our territories full of, uh, of dams, but we don't even get the electricity. And it's now, a pro it's now even a problem causing flooding. So when we talk of the just transition, we need to make sure that it's not just the issue of, of um, of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, the, the, the need to provide for electricity now as a renewable, but the issue of equity, who benefits from it. If we do the transition and, and ADB is going to support the just transition, it cannot be business as usual anymore. It has to ensure equity and it has to be in partnership with indigenous communities if our lands and, and resources are going to be used. So in that sense, the partnership that we can have in, uh, in relation to the just transition are community-based renewable energy projects for ADB to support instead of these large dams that are destroying our resources and, uh, and are not even giving us the electricity. The other one is also the use of our resources. Uh, so 
So these are avenues where I think it's a great opportunity for ADB, indigenous peoples and states to work together in the, in the context of respecting our rights. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Uh, I, I think on the safeguard side, uh, you know, the, the challenges of IFPIC, uh, the, the, the need for budgets for meaningful participation, uh, GRMs or grievance re redress mechanisms that, that are designed to meet the needs of indigenous peoples are certainly areas that, that we are aware that, that need strengthening. And, and I think that our, our you know, the, those who are working on safeguards have, have heard this. I, uh, I'm really glad you brought up the climate uh, issues and, and that's an area where uh, I can assure you that uh, we think there are opportunities also for partnership and we'll be looking to uh, follow up with you on how we can, how we can make this happen uh, quickly and at scale and effectively. Uh, so thank you very much for, for raising that opportunity. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. K. Srikant, to, uh, who's chairman and managing director of PowerGrid. Uh, Srikant, PowerGrid has been a long-term partner with ADB and works towards applying good international practices as part of your own business model and sustainability practice, practices. In fact, uh, I should congratulate you on, on the leadership role that, that PowerGrid has played in this regard. Could you briefly share with us your perspectives on why good practice safeguards matter and what your views are on some of the key areas that need further consideration? Thank you. Thank you, Varun. Uh, Power Grid and ADB go a long way. Uh, we had the first loan in 1996, and uh, now we have, I think, about three and a half billion uh, from 12 different loans. Uh, as the largest uh, transmission utility uh, in our country, uh, we have uh, Power Grid with the support of ADB and other uh, multilateral financial institutions was successful in developing a one nation, one grid, unifying all the five regional grids. Our businesses, like any other, intertwined with environmental, social and governance aspects. And it is imperative now to proactively engage with all the stakeholders on these issues for a sustainable growth. It is, you know, as a strong proposition, ESG proposition is uh, essential. It attracts investors because the global community, it's not just the multilateral financial institutions, but even the uh, funds and other investors are keen to associate only with sustainable uh, practices, institutions which are engaged in sustainable activities. Uh, it is also good for the uh, balance sheet because uh, it facilitates cost reductions, lower energy commission, uh, uh, consumption or reduced water intake, uh, reduced use of resources, good for the uh, bottom line. And also it improves the opportunity set for the company to grow. Uh, just to give an example, the fact that we have uh, been uh, uh, the first ut utility to give an uh, accreditation by the ADB to use their own uh, standards, uh, environmental standards, is uh, a big USP for us when we go out and offer consultancy services. So. A good uh, practices also facilitate growth. Pagrid has been committed to the environmental and social uh, measures. In 1998, we came out with our first written document of environmental and social policy procedures, and thereafter updated it in 2005, 2009, uh, in consultation with the World Bank and ADB. Now, some of the best practices which we have for every project, irrespective of the funding source, we do a comprehensive environmental and social assessment study. We do mandatory alternative analysis study, at least two alternatives while selecting the route, avoiding the sensitive areas uh, which are environmentally or socially sensitive. So we believe in the principle of avoidance, minimization and mitigation. I think one other tool which we have and which we are very much uh, uh, using is the corporate social responsibility uh, expenditure. 
We are implementing various need-based schemes under CSR to ensure livelihoods for economically marginalized communities. Uh, in the last two years, we would have spent more than 5.9 billion rupees in uh, various projects developing healthcare, education, sanitation, skill development, rural development, and environmental sustainability. And as power grid, we are also uh, continuously striving to uh, improve the benchmarks we have uh, and to put greater targets. Uh, we are now committed to uh, source 50% of our electricity from non-fossil sources by 2025, increasing the water recharging to 50% of our total consumption within next five years and so on. Uh, we could reduce the requirement of forest for the lines. Uh, land has been optimized, reduction in the water uh, consumption. So these are some of the benefits which we got by doing these uh, sustainable uh, practices and following the uh, environmental and social guidelines. But one point I would like to mention as a utility uh, that India is a growing economy. We have only 1,200 units, uh, kilowatt hours as the per capita consumption, which is uh, about 40% of the global average. So there is a good way to go forward for our growth and development. So we need to balance the um, compliances and also the opportunities for grow because neither of them, I mean, they are not alternatives, but they need to go together. So when we do the uh, new safeguard policy, I think this is one key aspect that the alternative of no project is also to be uh, weighed uh, in the context of each country and in the context of its growth trajectory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Srikant. The, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Power Grid was the, the first and, and actually the only uh, entity to, to uh, meet the criteria for uh, for utilizing your uh, safeguards and uh, as opposed to ours, what we call country systems. Uh, and congratulations for that. It's a it's a it's a very high bar uh, to get over that hurdle. I, I think it's really fascinating that that taking that approach has helped you to to actually move into. Uh, other areas of social and environmental investment, as well as improving resource conservation and, and uh, efficient utilization of resources. So thank you very much for that. And we look forward to continued uh, work with you and, and, uh, and hope that Power Grid can continue to reach out to others and help them to move along the same path. Uh, so finally, I'd like to invite uh, Gachatan Sandhu Director of Programs at ILGA World. Uh, Gachatan, you've been a champion for human rights and, and non-discrimination for many years. Uh, currently, the ADB 2009 Safeguard Policy highlights the importance of addressing gender risks and risk to poor and vulner vulnerable people and groups. However, the policy does not give explicit attention to particular groups such as people with sex, uh, different sexual orientation and gender identity. This has been discussed in, in many of our recent consultations for the policy update with clear recommendations that ADB should give more focused attention to this. Can I ask you to help set out some of the key issues, including why and how safeguards should give specific focus for, uh, to risk for LGBTI people, and how this can be effectively implemented in different contexts across Asia and Pacific. Thank you. Thank you very much, Warren. And um, uh, let me start off by th saying a big thanks to the Asian Development Bank for inviting Ilga Weld. Um, just so everyone knows, Ilga is the International Lesbian, Gay, um, Bisexual Association. We are a federation of 1,800 plus member organizations uh, from over 170 plus countries. Um, our tagline is Queer Democracy in Action. Um, also, would like to sort of um, thank the many um, members of ILGA that have been engaged in the um, consultations um, for the new um, safeguards. Let me start off by sort of taking a step back. Um, 
we often hear terminology thrown around around LGBTIQ plus rights. One of the key challenges here is that um, when we're looking at safeguards, it's very important not to treat LGBTIQ plus persons as a homogeneous group. Um, we're completely different when it comes to sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics. We're co covering a plethora of communities which have a divergent needs based on their locations, um, based on what country they're on, based on their national frameworks. So it's very important that when engaging with LGBTIQ plus persons, those differences, um, those voices from key segments within our communities are at the table. Um, in Asia, there's been immense, immense, immense advances when it comes to um, gender identity and gender expression. In Southeast Asia, we've seen rights being afforded to trans and non-binary and, and, and non persons. Of course, why not? Because in this part of the world, um, there's been a plethora of gender identities which have existed since the dawn of uh, civilization. You know, let me just give you an example. In, um, in, in uh, South Sulawesi, uh, the boogie people of South Sulawesi um, know that they have five words for, uh, for gender. Um, so, you know, it's important um, that those different groups and those different identities are at the table. However, um, going back to my point there is that whilst we're doing very, very well when it comes to trans and gender, non, uh, or not well, but doing well, progress is being made on trans and non-binary non, um, non identities. More still remains to be done in this region when it comes to sexual orientation, when it comes to uh, gay, lesbian, um, and bisexual persons, in particular, ensuring engagement of um, by and lesbian and bisexual and queer women. And that's very difficult when it can be done when it's put into actually practice as well. Um, for example, holding consultations. Um, at a time when lesbian and bisexual uh, queer women can attend. Um, we'd like to give you an anecdotal example when uh, Jessica Stern, the, uh, the um, current envoy uh, for the US government, special envoy on LGBTIQ plus rights in her former role, was in Morocco and was holding a consultation and there were no women in the room. Why? Because it was held at a time when LBQ women were able to attend and they were engaged in household chores. So that's really important when we're implementing safeguarding policies. The other aspect here is um, making sure that the that there are gender and SOGS plans, uh, SOGS plans in place. And I think a colleague um, 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 already has mentioned that. But one thing that is really also important to mention here is not just to have a siloed approach when it comes to working on gender, but having an interdisciplinary and interthematic approach. The issue when, when it comes to um, LGBTIQ plus people are, are indigenous people. LGBTIQ plus people are impacted by climate change, specifically in the Pacific Islands. Great work is currently being done by indigenous LGBTIQ plus persons in Samoa, in Tonga, and those examples need to be brought into consideration. So when you're working on safeguarding policies for climate change, when you're working on safeguarding policies concerning indigenous persons, those issues cannot be just siloed. And it's very imperative that LGBTIQ plus issues or gender issues are expansive and cut across other thematic areas as well. Um, and that brings me to the point that there should not be a, a hierarchy of rights. Um, ultimately, climate change does impact Indigenous people. It impacts LGBTIQ plus persons as well. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, perhaps hand over there because I think I've run out of time. <laughs> No, that's uh, thank you so much, Gurchat. And I, I, you know, I think we've we've uh, perhaps this is the area that will be uh, most challenging because of the variability from country to country, uh, but also the understanding within institutions like ADB uh, of the issues. So uh, uh, I, I'm I hope we can talk a little bit more about that in in the Q and A session. Uh, which is coming up. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank all of you, uh, all the panel members, for the insightful and important points that have been raised. Uh, now we're ready to hear from the audience. Uh, we've got about uh, 16 minutes and 39 seconds, according to the timer on my uh, screen, uh, for Q&A. 
Um, we have uh, a few questions that have come in that are really uh, oriented towards ADB. Uh, and I'm not going to try and answer those questions. I'm going to refer them uh, to our safeguard team and others if, uh, as relevant in ADB uh, and ask that they get back to you. Um, unfortunately, some of them are anonymous, so it's going to be hard for us to get back to you. Uh, but we'll figure out a way to maybe post this uh, uh, on our on the uh, website that, that where we're uh, maintaining Q and A around the policy update. Uh, so we'll get these questions posted and 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 uh, uh, and address them on the. Uh, on the website. I'd rather focus on questions to our panelists, if that's okay. And, and Joan, the first question we have in is for you. Um, and the question is, how long does it typically take to get FPIC for an infrastructure project in the Philippines? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think it depends on the kind of infrastructure uh, project. Uh, for example, if it's a uh, large energy projects it, it will take time and uh and and for small projects it's it's uh, short but the the general idea provided by by law is three to six months thank you um uh, i'm looking at the uh uh we have a question regarding uh Safeguard the labor safeguards, um, and uh, maybe maybe uh, any of you who feel uh, uh, have some experience around this can answer. Uh, but the the question is really where can contractors go? Uh, let's say under Secretary uh, Bataan, if in the Philippines, if you have a a subcontractor who uh, has has gone bankrupt and is supporting a project that's financed by ADB, for example, um, and, and where they, you know, where can those people go to get help? And how do you see, what do you see ADB's role? Uh, particularly if we have a labor, we, we will have a, a safeguard relating to labor in the future. Um, how would you perhaps see how you would work with ADB to make sure that that people uh, don't end up being uh, losing out uh, uh, in a situation where uh, they're sort of second or third or fourth hand uh, uh, from the actual primary contractor that uh, is being financed with an ADB loan, uh, but also uh, Srikant or anybody else who who might have some experience in this uh, would welcome you to to weigh in. This is a challenge ADB faces by the way, in, in uh, pretend, particularly potential risks when we, do find, uh, when we provide support to financial intermediaries. But it can also happen with, with project lending. Undersecretary? Yes, uh, yes. Um, I, I think first of all, uh, the, 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 to prevent this by happening, by making sure that uh, qualification requirements uh, minimize as much as possible the insolvency risk that we face with our contractors. Uh, we work very closely with the ADB team in aligning our uh, qualification requirements, everything from financial to the technical requirements of our contractors, especially for big projects, to make sure that they are able to handle uh, the implementation challenges uh, when it comes to our projects. But uh, Black Swan events happen, uh, like the pandemic, for example. Uh, while we fortunately did not see any of our ADB-funded contractors uh, folding uh, in situations where that may happen, then uh, one of the areas of uh, recourse or remedies may be in the performance security that our contractors are required to provide. Now, currently, there is no requirement in our uh, security uh, undertakings for our contractors to give priority treatment to 
uh, potentially displace the uh, laborers in case of bankruptcy. But uh, perhaps this is one area that uh, the evolving ADB social safeguards can look into in order to strengthen the protection uh, that are extended to laborers of our ADB-funded contractors. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, that's very helpful. And I think that that's actually a, uh, a really good point for our you know, as we look into the details uh, in in the new safeguards, obviously the the devil's in the details. So, as we look at this, we'll we'll need to uh, uh, take account of of that kind of a of a challenge. Uh, uh, Srikant, we've got a question for you here, which is: How do the safeguards by Power Grid respond to involuntary resettlement of communities by transmission lines in India, especially in the context when environmental compliance for such projects have been diluted? Uh, thank you. Primarily, there is no uh, land acquisition for a transmission line uh, because uh, the owners of the land uh, have the right to uh, do their farming or uh, you know, activities under the uh, lines in the corridor. They can't grow very tall trees or build structures, but uh, they have the right to do farming. Uh, so, in fact, even within the Tau footing, we have places where they do their farming, growing crops and all. Uh, so there is a system of compensating them for the loss, uh, diminution in value of the land. Uh, but as such, there is no resettlement of the people for laying transmission lines. Uh, coming to transmission substations to acquire land, and mostly it is under willing buyer, willing seller concept, where we have negotiated settlements. And very small areas are acquired. There is no large displacement for setting up substations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I'm. I'm uh, I, I love this question, Ilana. It's. It, I think you're the the best place to uh, answer it. And as you know, I've I've engaged with Bic for a long time. Uh, the question is, how do you rate ADB's safeguards efficacy? compared with other MFIs? Uh, the, the, the person who asked the, the comment, uh, uh, asked this question, said that it was interesting to hear that the World Bank is taking steps behind on climate change. I don't think we need to go into that, but I, I would be interested in, in how you, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the relative uh, uh, differences between us and how you would rate it. No, that's a wonderful question, and and it actually gets into um, a few different questions, but the one that I'm going to highlight is around implementation and often a gap between what's on paper and what is actually happening on the ground in projects. And I will say that in some ways, the ATB safeguards, um, you know, the last version of the safeguards that were revised uh, 10 or so years ago, a little more than that, um, were at the time really some of the highest standards that there were. However, we haven't seen those standards actually implemented. So while on paper those standards were above what existed at the time, um, I, I can't say that the ADB's safeguard performance has been near the top of the MDBs because there's really been a very significant gap between what's on paper and what's implemented on the ground. Thank you. I, I think that's uh, you, you. You avoided giving a comparison, which is probably a a, uh, a smart move. Um, so I've got a question for for Gurchatin. Um, and the question is, for countries that do not have clear gender policies or recognition of SOGESC, what do you propose should be done with safeguard requirements if they will be unevenly implemented? Um, that's a really good question. And I think we, we do need to recognize that not all countries have the same, we're not starting at the same start. Uh, we don't, all countries don't have the same starting point and, uh, national frameworks. I think, and I also wanted to uh, come back and address this, um, from an internal perspective as well. I think first of all, when it comes to ADB, 
and, and I've been in the international multi. Uh, inter, I've been an in international civil servant for many years. One of the key challenges you all automatically have is self censorship, and we censor ourselves before we even start the work working in big organisations like ADB or in within the UN system. So I think that needs to be um, addressed. Um, and then, it, because the automatic framework goes, well, this is too much of a sensitive issue. This country does not criminal. This country still criminalizes same-sex intimacy, or this country does not provide protections for uh, trans or non-binary persons. So that's one. Then number two, I think, when it comes to um, different entry points, look, when it again, it goes back to my initial question. When we're not a homogeneous group. There are different entry points to come in. Um, some countries may be progressing very well on uh, trans issues. So can you better t uh, team up and partner with trans organizations? Or um, there are some countries that in the, within the region working very well or, or have made progress on uh, decriminalization of same-sex intimacy. Can we work with those organizations? Or well, there's some organization, uh, countries that have made progress when it comes to intersex persons working on sex characteristics issues. So that could be definitely an entry, entry point. Then that's within our um, within the SOGS domain. But then, again, um, working with climate change activists, working with indigenous groups, and bringing in the um, angle of, um, of uh, SOGS rights um, through that window is also an opportunity. Um, and then the issue, of course, again, when it comes to um, uh, HIV in, uh, lens, or also uh, sexual reproductive rights, when it comes to um, gender-based violence, those are all avenues and entry points that can then lead you into working on um, LGBTIQ+, plus, um, um, providing LGBTIQ+, plus safeguards within those countries. Recommendations. Thank you. I, I want to go back to, Joan, I, I uh, unfortunately, I, in this system, I can't actually see you raise your hand, but I can yeah. raise your hand uh, after Ilana. So please, Joan, come in. No, I just want to share that in, in relation to uh, participation, a more meaningful participation, the the IFAD, the International Fund for uh, Agricultural Development, has has a has a strong process of engagement with uh, civil society. They have established mechanism for the direct engagement of uh, farmers and also indigenous peoples with their governance bodies, and and that is every two years. That's happening in Rome, and uh, there's also a direct consultation and, and dialogue that is now being facilitated up to the project and country level. So I think that is one example where ADB can learn in terms of uh, also its engagement with um, critical uh, actors, the rights holders on the ground that are affected by their projects. Just want to say, add that as well. Thank you, that's that's very helpful. I we have. Uh, I want to ask one last question, uh, and then we'll have a, a round of final comments from each panelist uh, before we have to close. Uh, this is for uh, Under Secretary Bataan. Uh, the question is: How can citizens in the Philippines express grievance in an environment in an environment where those who express opposing views are being red tagged? Tough question. Sorry for that. Um, yes, Warren, uh, one of the mechanisms that we have put in place as part of our uh, ADB-funded North-South Community Railway System is uh, the development of an online uh, grievance address mechanism that makes sure that there is an easy way for our project-affected persons to uh, bring to our attention their grievances on uh, many different aspects of a project. Again, in uh, most, if not almost all of the cases that we encounter, it's the uh, it, what we have seen as outcomes is essentially uh, our the, the grievances being addressed uh, sufficiently. Um, again, uh, of the thousands of uh, persons that we have relocated so far, we have not had to resort, result to any forced eviction or forced demolition out of all of the private property owners that we've had to uh, acquire properties from. More than 80% have voluntarily uh, sold to us. And I think uh, that goes to show that uh, having 
a, uh, a consciousness, very conscious regard of social safeguards, compliance, and reflecting that into the systems and the mechanisms and in the way of doing things of our people makes a very big difference in ensuring uh, that uh, social protections are accorded to uh, project-affected persons. Thank you very much. Uh, so we, we need to close here in a, in a minute. I'm gonna, I'd am going like to ask each of our panelists to uh, take 45 seconds to just give any final thoughts uh, uh, so we don't get cut off without uh, with somebody doesn't get cut off. So Srikant, could you uh, give us uh, quick thoughts? Yeah, two quick thoughts. Uh, one is the convergence, need for convergence. Everyone is after these social and safeguard issues. So the reporting, the compliances, I think the multilateral financial institutions need to converge so that for a project proponent, it is uh, cost of uh, compliance is reduced, it is eased. And the second aspect is that there should be a focus or there should be support to the local and national laws and regulations on these aspects. So there should be some flexibility built in to enable the growing countries to adopt national policies in this. I think these are convergence and flexibility that will help in these uh, policies. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Elana? Sure. So I'm actually going to echo my answer to the last question, which is on implementation, 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 because the ADB can have the most beautiful safeguards on paper that address climate, stakeholder engagement, gender-based violence, but unless the ADB communicates to its borrowers that these are important and critical elements and, and that the ADB provides the necessary capacity building to its clients. These are going to be uh, words on paper and aren't going to make a difference for the communities affected by ADB projects. Thank you. Uh, Joan, over to you. Yes, I have two points. One is for ADB to, to build meaningful participation of indigenous peoples through the establishment of effective consultation and engagement mechanisms at the project level, national level, and at the regional level. That, that's one. And second is to ensure effective accountability mechanism that is accessible to indigenous peoples and marginalized groups. The accountability mechanism of ADB now is, is, is I, I don't know how, uh, how to describe, it's definitely not accessible. And the only way we can also test how effective the, the, um, the uh, safeguards is also through the accountability mechanism. So that is an important uh, component to really look into. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gurchatan, over to you. Love to echo what uh, Ilana and Joan have already said. I think they've really summarized everything, so I won't repeat those, but ditto to that. I think the, one of the key things here is um, when it comes to gender as well, not a homogeneous group, recognizing that and recognizing the nuances and specificities of each and every single part and aspect of the community and going deep diving within those communities to understand the specific needs and the different populations, um, in particular the most marginalized voices. And then number two, I think internal capacity development so that internally within ADB, all staff understand this. And I think I would like to be a bit more risque and go a little bit further making sure your HR policies and when you're recruiting those staff, they understand that. And one of my biggest issues was within the UN when I was working there, was like telling HR, stop hiring the homophobes and the transphobes. You're doing that, you're letting those people. In. And I think that's one something that perhaps ADB needs to under also make sure in their HR policies. And then lastly and thirdly, I think sort of is having an interdisciplinary and interthematic approach to what was this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, uh, TJ. Yes, thank you, Warren. Um, again, from the perspective of, uh, large, of a large scale infrastructure implementing agency, uh, we always highlight that uh, we, based on our experience, uh, again, this is not something that we talk about out of the blue, but based on our experience, uh, conscious regard and uh, compliance with the environmental and social safeguards is not a hindrance to project implementation as, and is in fact something 
that would facilitate faster, smoother project uh, execution. And that is because in our experience, uh, a project where stakeholders have their trust and confidence, uh, a project where people know that we are just trying to be fair with them, is a project that everyone supports. And where you have the trust, the support of all of your stakeholders, then that's how you get projects off the ground and uh, out of court, out of uh, protests, out of uh, out of uh, uh, criti criticisms and uh, into implementation to deliver the outcomes that they are intended to deliver. So thank you, Wax. Thank you very much. Thank all. Thanks to all of you uh, for these uh, exceptional inputs. And I want to I want to first say that. Uh, to the audience that have asked uh, some, a number of really good questions. Uh, some of them are, as I mentioned, are intended for ADB, and we will respond to those. Uh, the ones that we haven't been able to convey to uh, our panelists, uh, we will see if they're willing to uh, provide answers, which we'll convey to you. Um, and uh, but But I really want to thank the panelists. We're, you know, in this cons consultation process for the new safeguard uh, policy. Uh, I, in my in my career, I've never seen such outreach and consultation. Uh, but it's never easy, and it's and it's, you know, we've got so many different stakeholders. These inputs from you as panelists are extremely valuable to us, and and we we're listening. Uh, we're trying, and, and we will reflect on, on all of the, the suggestions. And Gurchatin, I'll also pass on the message to HR. Uh, but uh, I, I really want to thank you. I've, I've Just a final note from me, personal note. I worked on my first environmental impact assessment in 1972. That shows kind of how old I am. Um, I was the first director of environment and social safeguards in ADB, and I can tell you that we've come since then. That was in 1999, I think, or 98. Uh, we've come a long, long ways, and it's because of the inputs from stakeholders like you and others that have enabled us to, to really, uh, I think, strengthen what we do, do a better job. And uh, Elena, I can tell you and, and others that, yes, it is about implementation. Uh, it's about building the internal capacity. It's about uh, strengthening the capacity of our of our partners, uh, our uh, our country partners, and and others. Uh, we're going to work on that. We're committed to it. And um, uh, again, uh, we you know the the more oversight we have, the better. Uh, and and we welcome that. And so thank you again, uh, all of you, for participating. I also want to thank Bruce Dunn and his team uh, and our safeguards team for organizing this. Uh, this is a very, very valuable experience for ADB, uh, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you all, and have a very good evening, morning, afternoon, night, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you.